The second reading today is Psalm 37, uh, verses 1 through 9. Don't get upset over evildoers. Don't be jealous of those who do wrong, because they will fade fast like grass. They will wither like green vegetables. Trust the Lord and do good. Live in the Lord and farm faithfulness. Enjoy the Lord, and he will give you what your heart asks. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust him. He will act and will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like high noon. Be still before the Lord and wait for him. Don't get upset when someone gets ahead, someone who invents evil schemes. Let go of anger and leave rage behind. Don't get upset. It will only lead to evil. Because evildoers will be eliminated, but those who hope in the Lord, they will possess the land. May God add his blessing to the hearing and understanding of his word. So I love the juxtaposition of the story we read from 1 Samuel with how firm a foundation and God's promise, I will never desert thee and your name, um, right? And I will be with you forever. And here is Saul thrown into a kingship, like, right? There's not ever been this office. There's not ever been this setup in all of Israel. There are armies attacking Israel that he's supposed to now defend because that's the whole reason Israel wants a king in the first place is to be safe. Every Everyone else is hiding and running, and he's trying to hold this line, and Samuel's not coming, and the troops are deserting, and so if he's going to do the job that he's been tasked with, that he's been called and anointed and appointed to do, then he's got to do something. And then because he does something, and it wasn't the exact right something, God is going to desert him? Like, now his name isn't going to be lasting forever? Like, this is it? One and you're done? I seem to remember some other scripture that talks about forgiveness 70 times 7. This is a really complicated and a really hard passage. And as much as I don't have any sympathy for Saul later on in the story, when he's throwing spears and doing some other horrible things, at this moment... I really have a lot of sympathy for him because he's trying really hard in a very impossible situation. And this story begins exactly as it did for Moses. God hearing a cry from the people and God coming to answer their pain and give them relief from their suffering. And that's Moses, God calling to Moses at the burning bush. And that's God arranging for Samuel the prophet to meet Saul to anoint him. And when Saul, Samuel goes to Saul to anoint him, Saul's like, wait a second, time out. I'm of the smallest tribe of all the 12 tribes, of the smallest family, a part of that smallest tribe. What are you talking about? But Samuel's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, you're the one, even though he's also very handsome and taller than everyone else, as scripture also says. <laughs> and then when Samuel, co- and this is Samuel and Saul in private, right? So then when Samuel goes to make this a public and anoint Saul, he's hiding among the supplies. Like he's not even coming out to take this. He's like, uh, I still don't know about this. And so I just want us to not forget that picture of Saul. And immediately he does take, right, that kingship that everyone else has been begging for and has been asking for, that thing that Samuel didn't want to give. He's like, I'll tell you what will happen if you have a king and gives this awesome long list that we would have. Or did you read last week, the First Samuel chapter 8? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward and, and pretty harsh. But here is Saul taking all of that on doing what the people have begged for, thrown into the midst of a really, really crazy, dangerous situation with the Philistines and all the military battles, going to those lines that everyone else is running away from and taking a stand there. So I want to talk about failure. Because what happens at Gilgal is written in scripture as a failure of Saul's, of this monarchy. 
And I wanna look at how we understand failure. And I want to maybe look at this in a way that sees failure as needed, as a part of our call. And I wanna think about this in two different ways as we go through the rest of the story thinking about failure. It's not something that we ever value, right? in our society and in our culture. It's quite the worst. There's terror and anxiety around it, and as we head back into a new school year, and I have a colleague, um, and many colleagues on college campuses who name the suicide rate and how terrifying it is and trying to care for students as they come up against what it means to fail and how they have to cope with that and deal with that and how we don't necessarily equip them to do that in a way that they can still value themselves and find ways through that. And that's just one example of a very pervasive culture of fear and anxiety around failure and of that meaning that we are not worthy. And I wonder if we can flip that to make it the exact opposite. Because if we are called to follow God God is always going to be beyond us. That is the very definition of God, is someone who is more and beyond us. And I shouldn't even say someone, because that still confines and limits God. And if we are never failing, then we're never going beyond ourselves and our own power. Then we're never going into that more and that beyond. What if we think about it like reconnaissance of scouts going out to find the area ahead? And of as you go out and find that, you very well could find a promised land and you very well in that same trip could find a lot of danger that might even harm you and even put your life at stake. But there's this African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And that far is only going to be in going, finding where we're going, finding some of the pitfalls of where we're going, and coming back to rework that knowledge and that understanding and learn it so that then once again we're better set to go in a way that will sustain life for more, for more people. So what if failing is actually being in the very center of where God needs us to be, is taking our worth and our divine image so seriously that we're willing to put it in danger for God and that more to come into our world and into our life. Because honestly, that's what Saul's doing in this moment. Saul's in a situation where he has to make a call. And as much as we read about or sing about in these hymns of how firm a foundation is our faith that God has laid for us, that the saints have laid for us, I don't know about you, but putting that faith into application is anything but clear and firm for me from day to day. Because there's always both and in the midst. There are multiple truths that are true and can't be true together. And so we have a monarchy that's being established because we need someone, an earthly king, to respond to the trials that we are facing immediately. And that's true. Saul will attest to that at Gilgal, facing down all of the chariots and all of the Philistines. We need that practical, quick response. But Samuel's truth of what a kingship might mean of the dangers of it, of the hierarchy that it sets up and the abuse of power that it makes possible and all of the taking that can happen, that's also just as true. And if we look at scripture from a non-literal perspective, understanding that this is a human writership as well as divine inspiration, then there's a pretty under, simple understanding for this part of the story in that this is David's story. And so it's written in a way by humans to honor and legitimize David's reign. And part of that means delegitimizing Saul and why David, who was the second king, was the king that we all think of and remember of when we go to Jesus being of the lineage of David. 
But there's also a truth that comes in this scripture when we take it both from a non-literal and a literal space. And that is the tension of these two exclusive truths of the need both for practical response and the danger that a monarchy sets up. Of the need for a prophecy, priestly based worship where God is our only king, but also of an awareness that that wasn't working either. Because Samuel is raising the theological concern of what happens to God as our only king when we set up an earthly king too. But the fact of the matter is that the priestly tradition and the way that Israel was organized before and tribes with judges that God would raise up to respond wasn't working well either. Remember Samuel's call and how the word of God was rare in those days? Remember Samuel's very first word from God was to condemn Eli's sons and how Eli let his sons abuse their power as priests and sin and how all of that system was falling apart. And what Samuel doesn't confess, right? We're always quicker to name someone else's sin and the dangers of a monarchy and taking us away from understanding God as our king. But Samuel's sons were sinning just like Eli's sons were sinning. And part of the reason the people came to Samuel wanting a king is because this pattern had just repeated again and there was no one left at the center of God's heart even when there wasn't an earthly king present. So who's exhausted now? And he's like, where's the hope? Like, if there's this much mess, if we can never find a way forward no matter what we do, then how do we do life? How do we work this? And this is where God comes in. We have just... Our Jewish cousins have just gone through Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur High Holy Days, the Days of Awe. And I got the privilege of going through that um, with an interfaith friend of mine. We're a part of a group, um, and she's the president of her shul. And what I found out and never realized before, right? Rosh Hashanah is the new year, is scrubbing off that covenant that God puts in our hearts, that word of life that God writes. And in Yom Kippur, it is sealed. The good news is God is always present in the messiness, in the both and. In a way that I want us to think about that is how the Ten Commandments were given. Hey, Sarah, do you have your Bible? No. All right. So if you turn to Exodus 31, 18, that's the first time that God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And those commandments, the stone tablets that they are written, are given to Moses from God. And God's finger inscribes the commandments onto them. So this is God only at work. And even if you don't take a literal view of the Bible, you have to at this point because there's no human participation in this. This is God's finger inscribing God's word onto the stone tablets that God has provided. There is only God at work in this moment. And what happens to those tablets? Moses goes down the mountain and what happens? What's he find? Golden calf. And what's Moses do with those tablets? Ready? And they shatter. Because here's this beautiful moment of call and understanding, and there's already mess. You don't get one second of clarity and application and running with this. And Moses is done. This is a failure. He's done moving through. He's done with these. Israelites, God is ready to wipe out him. Then what happens? Who starts praying? Moses starts praying. Israel starts praying. And God starts changing. And Moses goes up the mountain a second time. But this time, it's Moses who carves out the stone tablets according to God's instruction. And this time it's Moses who writes the commandments on the tablets 
that God is giving to him. God includes us. The Talmudic explanation for these two is that what God called us to, God found out was too far and high and above where we were. That the Israelites knew they couldn't even begin to measure up or follow that commandment. They were terrified of failing. And so they didn't even try. They just made a calf that they knew they could understand and deal with and follow. But the story doesn't end there. It doesn't end with that failure. It ends with learning. It ends with God changing how God gives us the commandments to steal on our hearts. It ends with God including the community all the more. It ends with a different first step. It ends with God helping us as God did for the Israelites under Saul and then under David, even if it means endangering God's own relationship with the people. And if we don't try things that are beyond ourselves, we won't ever fail. We won't ever tip one way or the other and find out how to balance in the midst of truths that are both and and a little bit exclusive and impossible. We won't ever find what it means to pick up the pieces of brokenness after failure and find a God who's still there, who still hears our cry and who's still ready to work with us and who's ready to help us take a different step, a step that we can manage together. This is the good news. We're gonna fail. And not only is it okay, it's needed. Because it's gonna teach us who we are, and it's gonna reveal to us who God is, and it's going to help us take one more faithful step. And God's not going to leave us if we come back to God and don't treat that failure as an end. And that's the story for next week. Because both Saul and David failed in major ways. But they both dealt with that failure in completely different ways that for Saul brought an end and for David brought another beginning. So may we not be afraid of failure. May we know that it is part of our call. And may it not stop us or drive us away, but do the exact opposite and call us further and deeper in. And in that, may we find what it means to wait for the Lord. And in that moment, may we find what it means to serve a God who is always working for our good, in failure and in success. Amen.